Well, welcome to Hope City Church. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors on staff, and uh, we are excited that you're here today, and happy 4th of July weekend. Um, anybody else have fireworks going off all night in your neighborhood? Yeah. yeah. Uh, in Shepherdsville, where we live, it seems to start the week before, and it ends the week after. So for like two weeks straight, it seems almost every night there are fireworks going off. So it's not even the 4th of July yet, and I'm actually already sick of the fireworks. Um, Christine and I were watching TV last night, uh, Quantico season two, if anybody watches that. Um, Apparently not. Um, But we were watching TV, and all I could think about with every firework that was going off, I was getting more and more frustrated. And I was thinking, man, I just want to watch my show. I, I don't want my daughter to wake up. All of these thoughts were in my head, and here's what I was thinking. Here's what God, I felt, was telling me in this moment. They're having a celebration, but I'm distracted. Like, I can't celebrate with them because I'm distracted. I'm focused on something else. And today, we're talking about worship. And I thought, so many of us come into a worship service the same way. We're distracted. We have things going on, and and we can't get on board. Maybe we're just going through the motions, but we come in, and we struggle to celebrate because we're distracted, right? And so today, we're going to be talking about worship. And my hope, my, my hope for all of us is that we can come in here with our distractions and we can hand them to God. And so we're going to try to unpack this topic. There's so much to talk about with worship, but we're going to try to unpack it today. We're in a, a series right now called Making Sense of Spiritual Things, where we're literally trying to make sense of spiritual things. Um, and so last week, Pastor Jason talked about the Bible why we can trust it, the validity of it, the power of the Bible. And this week, we're going to be talking about worship. So I'm extremely excited. Worship has been uh, something that is close to my heart. It's been life-changing for me, um, and I'll talk a little bit about why later. Um, But I'm excited to talk about worship. So a few years ago, um, Christine and I got this amazing opportunity to uh, quit jobs and move to Louisville and study worship for an entire year almost. Um, So no pay, nothing else. It was an awesome opportunity, right? Um, But we got to study worship for an entire year. Um, And for me, this was exhilarating. Like for some of you, you might think that sounds boring, but it was exhilarating for me. And I got to dive deep into this one topic for so long and I I got to learn so much. And so uh, my goal today is to reiterate that entire year to you guys in 30 minutes. Uh, So I hope you packed your lunch. Um, Now the first service was was not long, it's gonna be fine. But um, I do want to just unpack these big ideas about what it is why we do it, what it's all about. So I'm going to start with this question today. What comes to mind when you think of the word worship? What comes to mind? For some of us, maybe you were born in the church, you you came out of the womb like your hands raised, thank you Jesus for my breath, for my life, and you were in church every week of your life, you know all the Bible verses, you know the ins and outs about it, or at least you know all the head knowledge about it. But there's a lot of people In this room, outside of this room, we're all on different pages. We all have different experiences, different traditions, different beliefs. So there's a lot of people in this room that aren't on that same page. And so some of us in this room, we may think specifically of the style of worship. Maybe it's what you grew up with, traditional hymns. Uh, For me, I grew up Catholic, and so I grew up with an organ and a choir. Um, So maybe it's more reverent for you. But for others, maybe you think of more like what we do here on a Sunday with a worship band. Maybe you think of, uh, you know, falling out at the altar and powerful moves of the Spirit and all of these things. There are people all over the spectrum. But there's still others in this room that are totally foreign to this idea of worship. Maybe today's your first time walking in the doors of a church. Maybe you've only been a few times. And so you think, what are these people excited about? Why are they raising their hands? Why are they singing? Why are they clapping? I don't get it. You're just confused when it comes to worship. So we want to unpack some of that as well today. There are opinions all over, experiences all over the map. And I don't know everybody's experience, but here's what I do know. We all worship. We all worship. It's not just for the religious, not just for the Christian. Worship is for the Christian, the atheist, the young, the old, people all over the world. We all worship. We all worship. But what is it all about? Well, last week, Pastor Jason talked about how we can trust the Bible. And so that's where we start. We start by seeking what God is saying about worship. 
And so we're going to look in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. And here's what Paul writes about worship. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. What he's saying is that everything is an opportunity to worship. In anything, everything that you do, you're going to worship something, but do it for God. And when we say the glory of God, what we're saying is, is to honor God in what we do, to show him love, to show him respect, to do it for him, not us, to do it for him, not the end of someone else. And so that's what we say when, when we say to the glory of God, right? So whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Pastor John Piper says that we're to be a people that drink orange juice for the glory of God. I don't really like orange juice, so it'd be really difficult for me to drink orange juice for the glory of God. So let's pick something else. We're going to pick pizza. We're to be a people that eat pizza for the glory of God. Who doesn't like pizza, right? I don't think anybody in this room doesn't like pizza. So how would you possibly eat pizza for the glory of God? Well, you sit and you look at this amazing pizza, um, wherever your you know, preferred place is, and you look at the pizza and you think to yourself, God, when you made the heavens and the earth, when you made the, the cows and the pigs and the grains and, and the beautiful thing we call carbs, when you made all of those things, you made it for thousands of reasons probably, I'm sure you did, but at least one of those reasons was so that I could eat this pizza. You just bring God into the equation. He wants to be part of everything. He wants to be part of you eating pizza. He wants to be part of the ins and outs of your life, right? And so, yeah, we, we cross oceans to be missionaries for the glory of God. But moms, dads, are you changing your baby's diapers for the glory of God? We're about to have two in diapers. I don't think I'm giving God much glory when I change those diapers, right? I'm not excited about it. I don't want to do it, right? So how do you change your baby's diaper for the glory of God? It's all in your mindset. You got to invite God in. Think about how God feels. God, I made a mess in my life too. You get in there, you clean it all, God, right? Like you clean it all. You just invite God into the process. College students, high school, middle school students, are you going to class for the glory of God? Are you studying for the glory of God? Singles, are you dating for the glory of God? Are you not dating for the glory of God? Married couples, is your marriage glorifying God? Did you watch college basketball all day for the glory of God, right? Did he even enter your mind? Are you aware of him? Are you conscious of him? Whether you eat or drink, it says. What's eating and drinking? Eating and drinking is the very basic functions of daily life. You don't have to think about it. It's not hard. You just get hungry and you go to the pantry, you grab something and you eat. You get thirsty, you go to the fridge, you grab something and you drink, right? The very basic functions of life. And so whether you are in the basic functions of life or, this is my favorite part, whatever. You wouldn't think the Bible would say, or whatever. Like, you fill in the blank, right? It says, or whatever. So whether you're eating or drinking or whatever you do, fill in the blank. Nothing's out of the question. Do it for the glory of God. Do it for the glory of God. So in everything that we do, we have the opportunity to bring something glory. God says, let it be for me. Let it be for me. But if you look at God's word, there's also a call to worship him corporately. And what that means is to worship him as a group, as a church, like we do here on Sunday mornings. And so, yes, worship is about everything. Worship is about glorifying God in all that we do. That's the big picture. But why do we meet why do we sing? Why do we hear a sermon and call it a worship service? That's what I want to kind of unpack for the rest of our time because I think this is the area that gives us the most confusion. This is what gives us the most confusion, right? So uh, we're going to be looking at Psalm 95. Um, and as I mean, you can turn your Bibles there, pull it up on your mobile device, it's also going to be up on the screen. But as we look at this, here's what I want to kind of answer. Question one is, what is worship? Question two, why do we worship God? And three, how should we worship God? So what is worship? Why do we worship God? And how should you worship God? So let's go ahead and start reading Psalm 95. Oh, come, 
Let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For the Lord is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts, as you did at Meribah, as on the day of Massa in the wilderness. So, there's a lot of information in there. Um, but here's what I want to break down in this psalm. We see, we see three things in here. In the, the words thankful, joyful, what are those? They're emotions, right? Sing with a joyful noise. Be thankful. Worship engages our emotions. So it engages the emotions of our heart. And then we see that they start listing off what God has done. He created the sea. He created the mountains. He created the dry land. It's truth about God. So worship engages the thoughts of our mind. It engages the truth that we believe about him. And then three, there are words like bow down, kneel, don't harden your heart. These are words of obedience, of submission. So worship engages the obedience of our hands. And so uh, we're going to call it head, heart, and hands, okay, just to make it easy. So worship engages the thoughts of our head, the emotions of our heart, and the obedience of our hands. Worship engages all of us. It demands all of us, right? But what is it? What is worship? Worship is simply what we respond to the most or what is most important in our life, right? The easy definition is um, how we respond to what's most important in our life. And so think about this. Something in your life has ultimate value. Something in your life has ultimate value. Maybe for you, it's money. Maybe you think about money more than anything else. Everything you do is, is working towards money. You stress about money. But then for others, it could be your family. It could be your kids. It could be your career. It could be whatever you're seeking the most, whatever you're stressing about the most, right? What consumes you? What consumes you is possibly what you worship. What consumes you is possibly what you worship. And this is our problem. It has been all along, right? We know how to worship. We know how to see the value in things. We know how to respond to things that are important to us. But the object of our worship is often what we get wrong. Because it's so easy to put our hope in other things. We can see them. They're tangible. They make a small impact in our lives. But what God is saying as we read through uh, 1 Corinthians when it says, do everything for the glory of God, he's saying nothing else is worthy of your worship. Nothing else is going to fulfill you like I do. Nothing else is constant. It doesn't last, right? Everything else might make you happy for a short time, but it's not going to last forever. It's fleeting. It's, it's going to eventually disappoint you. So, worship is what we respond to, what has ultimate value, what we seek, what we run after. We all worship, right? We all have something of ultimate value in our lives. But why do we worship God? Why do we worship God? Let's look at verses three through seven. It says, for the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands form the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship. Let us bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he's our God, and we're the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. How could we not worship this God, right? Why do we worship God? The better question is, how could we not worship this God, right? He made everything. 
He made the heavens and the earth. He made the sea, the dry land. By the way, he made us. He's our maker, right? We exist because of God. He made us. And he made us to enjoy his presence, to enjoy his creation, and, and to enjoy all the blessings that he puts on us and hands us. And this, for me, makes the most sense when, I'm, when I get away and I'm on a beach or maybe in a national forest. Maybe some of you guys have experienced this. Maybe even in a park locally, just at an overlook. But you sit and you look off a cliff or, or in the vastness of the ocean and you think to yourself, like, I can barely see 100 yards, but God made the ends of the earth. He made all of this. Like, I can't even take it all in. If I traveled the world, I still couldn't take it all in as God does, and he made it all. How big must our God be, right? How big, how creative, how much of an artist must our God be to have done all of this? And not just that. I love this line in verse 7. It says, that we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. We're his. He's our maker, right? He's not just a distant God. He's not a distant ruler. He's our God. He calls us his children. He calls us his own. Like, we are claimed by him. He cares for us. And then we see the analogy, the comparison of a sheep with his shepherd, and, and we see this all through the scriptures, and I love it. Because what does a shepherd do? A shepherd leads. A shepherd guides. They provide everything the sheep needs. They feed them when they're hungry. They, they make them rest and lie down. They find the nicest, shadiest pasture for them to lie down in. And then when it's time to get up, they motivate them to get up and they lead which way they should go. They provide everything for the sheep. But not only that, we, we miss this because we don't interact with too many shepherds in our day, uh, but shepherds are warriors. They stand in between the sheep and the wolves, right? A shepherd isn't this like wimpy guy in a robe wandering around a pasture. They are a warrior. They are strong because they stand between the wolves and they fight the wolves off so they don't attack the sheep. God has done this for us. He's done the same thing for us, right? God provides all that we need, and through Jesus Christ on the cross, he stood between us and death. He stood between us and death. He said, no matter what you've done, no matter who you are, you're mine. Nothing is gonna stand in the way of my love for you, right? So God stood between us and death. The better question is, how could we not worship this God? Then the last section that I kind of want to talk through is, is how should we worship God? Because there's a lot of controversy over this. Um, how should we worship God, right? There's this thing that has been going on for years called worship wars, and maybe you, d you know about it, maybe you don't. Um, but churches, church leaders are in an argument over how we should worship God. What's appropriate in the church? Hymns versus contemporary music and pews versus stadium seats and all of these things, like we always make it about petty things, right? And so there's this thing called worship wars. How should we worship? But all along, it's right here. God told us how to worship. It's in the scriptures, right? And even in Psalm 95, it lays out how we should worship. And the first thing we see is that we worship together. We worship together as a community, like we're doing right now, gathered together as the church. But why do we worship together? Why can't we just worship privately? Why can't we just worship privately? Some of you may say that I connect with God better one-on-one -on -one and all of those things, and that's not bad. We want to worship privately. Even Jesus modeled that for us, right? He went up on the mountain. He had solitude, but he came back. He always came back to be with the people because even in creation, the only thing that God said was not good was for man to be alone. He said it's not good for Adam to be alone, right? And so we're created to be in community and we'll never experience the fullness of who God is unless we do it in the context of community. It's like when you're, um, you're dating someone for the first time. If you just go on one-on-one -on -one dates but you never see them interact with their friends, they never see you interact with your friends, they don't meet your family, you don't really know the real them, right? You want to see how they 
interact and how they act with other people, and they want to see that in you, right? If you just go on one-on-one dates, you don't really know the person, right? And one day you might be really surprised. So what benefits do we have from worshiping God together? Why, why are we called to worship God together? Well, Paul tells us in the book of Ephesians that uh, we sing songs to God, but we sing songs to each other. Do you ever think about that? Like Sunday mornings when we show up and we gather here, we're singing songs to God, but we're also singing them to each other because most of us aren't ready to worship. Like I said earlier, talking about the 4th of July, like we're not ready when we come in here. We've had tough weeks. We're dealing with sickness. We're dealing with problems at home, problems at work. We're anxious. We're depressed. We're addicted. We're all of these things. We're not ready to just jump in and start worshiping, right? God has to soften us a little bit. And so when we sing these truths about God, yeah, we're honoring God and we're we're lifting up thanks and praise to God, but we're also reminding our brothers and sisters in this church, oh yeah, God is good. Oh yeah, he is in control. God does want the best for me. He does love me. His grace is enough, right? And so we sing the truth about God. And that also, while it brings him glory, it builds up the church. It draws us close to him and it it breaks walls down in our lives and it allows us to worship him, to seek him more. And so we worship God together. We also worship God together because we get more of God when we do it together. Let me explain what I mean by that. People in your life bring out different things in you. So you may act different around your aunt than you do your spouse. You may act different around this friend than your friend from high school. People bring out different things. Maybe it's the adventurer. Maybe it's the rebellious one. Maybe it's the kind one. Whatever it is, people bring out different things in you, right? And so when we gather as the church, we're seeing how God acts in each and every person because it's a personal relationship with God. He's not the same with each and every one of us. And so when we gather together, we get to experience how God works in you and you and you, not just me. And we get to see what he's doing that is beyond what's happening in me. So we get more of God and we also give him more glory, right? God is worthy of more than just the praise I can give on my own. He's worthy of more than what I have to offer on my own. And so when we gather together, he gets more glory. The Great Commission is to go and make disciples. We're supposed to grow this thing, right? Hope City Church, our doors are open. Our doors are open. It's not some country club where we say, man, we met our quota. Sorry, you're going to have to go to that church across the street. No, we want to grow because God gets more glory. As we come together, God gets more glory. So if that is true, then obviously the more the merrier, the more diverse, the better, right? That's our commission. God gets more glory when we do it together. So we worship together. And what else do we do when we gather? We sing. We sing. You'll see at the beginning of the psalm, it says, let us sing to the Lord. Make a joyful noise with songs of praise. Why do we sing? At a typical Hope City Church service, we sing, and then we hear a sermon, and we sing a little bit more. But why? Why all the singing, right? Um, It helps us seek God. Singing helps us seek God. In 2 Kings chapter 3, um, there's a prophet named Elisha, and he's trying to hear from God. He needs to hear from God. And so he says, bring me a musician. Bring me a musician. And the musician comes and starts playing, and it says that the hand of the Lord was laid upon him. And now, this isn't some mechanical process where God doesn't speak unless music is playing. God didn't speak to Elisha because of the music but the music helped Elisha to seek him, right? Elisha was distracted, like many of us are. He couldn't focus. He needed the music to help him focus on God. And through that process, God spoke to him. Because music has a power. What is music's power? It can change moods. It can change moods, right? You can be tired and lazy, sitting on the couch, watching Trolls, and Justin Timberlake starts singing, and you just wanna dance, right? It totally changes your mood. It can make you sad, it can make you happy, 
can make you encouraged. It can make you all sorts of things. Music has a power to change moods. And this was the ultimate purpose God created music. God created music. Did you know that? Man didn't create it, and now we just all of a sudden use it to worship God. God created music for the primary purpose of helping us seek him. So, as a people, we sing. And you might say, I just don't worship God that way. I'm not an emotional person. I just want to push back a little bit on you this morning. Um, I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true because you get emotional about something. You might not get emotional about God, but you get emotional about something, right? If the Cardinals and the Wildcats are on TV, you probably get emotional about that. If someone came to your door and said, hey, you just want a million dollars, you might get emotional about that, right? Or would you just say, oh, okay, thanks. Close the door. <laughs> I'm just not an emotional person. No, like you get emotional about something. And from the beginning of time, God's people were an emotional people. They were a singing people. Why? Because some things are too great just to be spoken. You have to sing them, right? It's not enough just to speak some truths. You're overwhelmed. You're ravished by it. You have to sing it, right? You have to sing it. And so we're a singing people. And then we see verse 7. You hear his voice. You hear God's voice. There's an aspect of worship that has to be rooted in truth. You have to hear from God. How do we hear from God? Pastor Jason talked about it last week. The, the number one way we hear from God is through God's word, through God's word. Because in order to worship God, you have to know God. You have to know him for who he really is, not who we're thinking of in our minds, not who we're creating based on personal preference. You have to accept the one true God and you get to know God through his word. He speaks to you through his word. And we can't worship God apart from the word. And then the last thing we see is through obedience and submission. Worship and truth and spirit and emotion moves us to obedience, right? As I said earlier, worship in the head and the heart moves you to the hands. It involves all of you. It demands all of you. And so the worship of God should draw you closer to God, closer to trusting him more. So when he calls, you go. When he asks something of you, you answer. You trust him more. You grow in obedience. You grow in submission. And we see that as it says, kneel, bow down. Don't harden your heart when God calls you. Don't harden your heart. And I love the imagery of those verses because it lets us know that Worship is expressive. It's expressive. You might see people, um, if you're one of the people that are kind of foreign to worship, you come in here, we're singing, you see people lifting their hands. Why do we lift our hands? To say, God, you're awesome. God, we adore you. God, we're excited about what we're singing because it's true. And then we might hold our hands this way to say, God, whatever you have for me, God, I surrender to you. We may kneel to say, God, you're in control. God, I submit to you whatever you have for me, God. And then we, we clap. We clap a lot around here. Um, we like to party during our worship services. And so we clap a lot to say, God, we're applauding what you've done and what you're going to do. We believe that you're going to do amazing things, right? We're applauding. We're celebrating. We're expressive. And we don't do these things because everyone else around us does them because um, it's what you do in church. We do them because we're overwhelmed, we're ravished, we are sincerely moved by what God is doing, by how he saved us, by what he's done on the cross through Jesus and what he's continuing to do in our lives. And so true worship is expressed with all of us. It demands all of us demands our head, the thoughts of our head, the emotions of our heart, and the obedience of our hands. At the beginning, I said um, that worship has changed my life. And a few years, well, uh, back in 2009, so more than a few years ago, um, God encountered me and opened my eyes to worship. So I was engaged to Christine and she broke off the engagement. And don't get mad at her because it was for God's glory. We just didn't know it at the time. Um, so she broke off the engagement. 
and I was devastated. I was completely destroyed. Like I, I was caught off guard. I didn't know why this was happening. I felt like my whole world was crashing down. And here is what God spoke to me in that moment. When everything else is gone, I'm still there. When everything else is gone, I'm still there. And here's what I realized. God wasn't the object of my worship. He wasn't the object of ultimate value in my life. Christine was. All of my hope, my happiness, everything I had was wrapped up in her. And that's not fair to her. It might sound sweet to some people, but it's not fair because she wasn't meant to carry that burden. She wasn't meant to be my savior. She wasn't meant to be everything to me. Only God can carry that. Only God can live up to that. Everything else eventually disappoints. And so God opened my eyes to realign my worship, to give it to him. And many of us make other things our savior. Many of us put our hope in other things that aren't going to last. They're eventually going to disappoint. And my prayer for us, my hope, is that we would be able to recognize that and we'd be able to surrender it to him this morning. And so I want to end today by um, encouraging you to pray a prayer. I want you to identify what it is that has ultimate value in your life. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's soccer, basketball. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your bank account. Maybe it's an addiction. Something that you've put your hope in that isn't living up to the expectations. Identify what has ultimate value in your life and ask God to replace it with him. And so here's a simple prayer that I want to teach you this morning that we can pray to ask God to replace that with him. And it just says, God, I want more of you. Will you become greater? And whatever that is, you fill in the blank, become less. God, I want more of you. Will you become greater and that become less? Let's pray.